As we join together for our Bible study today, uh, we're going to focus in on what does God say about face masks. Uh, since this last week, um, Minnesota joined the many other states around our country uh, in uh, mandating wearing face masks in an indoor public setting. And so what does the Bible have to say about this? Uh, what does God have to say to us? And so this is, some, this is where we're at in our world. This is where we're at in our lives. And instead of kind of trading opinions and just kind of saying what we think, well, instead, let's go back and let's see what God's got to say about this issue. A, a Bible study that we never would have had a, a year ago, even six months ago. And yet, this is where God has brought us. This is where God has called us to serve. So as we begin our time together in a Bible study, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank and we praise you that you are faithful. Uh, you are the one who calls us. You are the one who saves us. Uh, you are the one who is there for us each and every single day. And so, Lord, thank you. Lord, we pray that you uh, open up our hearts and our minds and guide our time together in your word as we have this opportunity to dive into seeing what you have to say about wearing face masks. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So for our Bible study, as always, yes, you are going to need a Bible. You can get your out your paper Bible or uh, Bible on your phone or your tablet, however you like to look up God's Word. And you'll just say right off the get-go that the, the term face mask is not in Scripture. Uh, that, you know, Scripture doesn't talk specifically about these kinds of face masks. But God is very clear, and he does give us a lot of direction to be able to guide this conversation. So you need a paper and pencil to be able to take some notes. And of course, ironically, if you're at home or by yourself participating in this Bible study, well then ironically, a Bible study on face masks, well then you don't need to wear a face mask if you're at home or by yourself. But if you would like to wear a face mask while participating in this Bible study, you are always more than welcome to. So much of the conversation gathered around face masks is oftentimes not even around how efficacious they are, like how useful are they. Um, some studies that say that they're very useful and very effective in preventing uh, the spread of the virus. Um, studies, some studies that say they're nah, a little bit helpful. And so throughout this study, uh, we're not getting into the and debating kind of the different research on uh, face masks. Instead, we're diving into the Bible to see what God has to say. And so, so much right now, the conversation right here in Minnesota is around the mandate now the requirement for wearing masks when indoors in a public setting or when outdoors and you're less than six feet apart in between households. So when we're kind of talking about this, a, a government mandate in our lives, classic passage for us to be able to go to is Romans chapter 13. Now, this is a passage that we, we went here ah, a couple months ago. When we're having a Bible study on should we obey God, should we obey the government, or should we obey both? Um, we, kind of, we walked through both this Romans 13 and then Acts chapter 5, which we're going to take a look at next. So let's take again a quick walk through Romans 13 and then also Acts chapter 5 as well. So if you open up your Bibles, uh, Romans chapter 13. Um, this is a letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in, that's right, Rome. He wrote to them in Rome. And at this point in time, things were not good for Christians. Uh, the Roman government was way more invasive um, than the American government. Uh, we think we've got a bad, it was nothing compared to the persecution and literally getting thrown into a gladiator's den with a bunch of lions and getting torn to shreds. I mean, we've got a... We can't even hold a candle to what it was like being a Roman Christian at this time. And yet, so then so Paul's writing with a, the, kind of this context going on that persecution was very definitely ramping up in the Roman Empire against Christians. And as then Paul writes to them, he talks to them about what it means to 
obey the authorities. Like, how do we? How are we supposed to follow the governing laws of the land? So let's do uh, verses. Let's read just verses one through ten all together, and then we're going to come back and then just kind of pull these verses apart quickly. So let's get the whole context and read verses one through ten. Paul writes. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So much going on here. So much great stuff here in Romans 13. So let's go back and let's pull it apart piece by piece. Um, so let's start out and let's read just verse one. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. So God is the one who allows leaders to be in control. Uh, that you know, God is the one who allows the leaders to be there. Uh, whether they're elected, whether they're appointed, uh, whether they're born into the office, um, like like a monarchy, uh, it doesn't matter. God is the one who is ultimately in control. He is the true king who governs everything. And he's the one who allows the leaders to be in control. And so we're not just talking about obeying civil authorities for the sake of civil authorities. We're ultimately talking about a spiritual issue, but obeying and remembering what God sets in place. So let's keep going. Let's read just verse 2. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So again, breaking the law is sinning. Plain and simple. If we're breaking a law of our land, we are sinning against our fellow man, and we're sinning against God. Plain and simple. Now, what happens when a law then comes in conflict with God's word? When a law is telling us to sin? We'll get there. We're going to get to that point. Um, but right here, but here's the thing. Most laws are not commanding us to sin. Most laws, you have tax laws, uh, you have traffic laws, you have seatbelt laws. Most laws are not explicitly going against God's word. And so this is something that's serious that, you know, God gives us these laws in our land and he, God works through government leaders to give us laws to keep us safe uh, for, for the protection of our fellow man and also to keep kind of chaos and anarchy from breaking out. So let's keep going. Let's read verses three and four together. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right. But for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. 
So God gives us government and he gives us laws in our land to maintain order. I, I love the classic example here of, you know, that when you're doing when you're doing things right, when you're obeying the laws of land and being a good citizen and being a good neighbor, then you have nothing to be afraid of. But for me, always kind of the, one of the classic examples of this is when you're driving down uh, the interstate and uh, and there's a cop driving right behind you. And, and you notice the cop in your rearview mirror and he's back there and all of a sudden the cop flips on his lights. Now, I don't know about you, but the first thing that I usually do is look down at my speedometer and see how fast I was going. Now, if I'm driving speed limit and the cop flips on his lights behind me, I'm not as worried. Oh, he must have gotten a call. He's must going to pass me and go around and go to some emergency. But if I look down at my speedometer and I realize I'm speeding, all of a sudden, my heart is racing. I'm thinking, oh, great. Oh, no, he got me. And so, you know, when we do good, we, don't, we can live free from fear. God gives us the government and gives us laws in our land in order to maintain order. It's for our own good. So let's keep going. Let's read verse 5. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. That we obey the law because it's the right thing to do. That we do not race through town in a 30 mile per hour area driving 70 miles per hour. Um, we don't do that because that would be unsafe. It would be the wrong thing to do. It doesn't matter if there's a cop on the road or not. It doesn't matter if we're going to get a ticket or not. We don't race 70 miles per hour through town because that's not safe. Because it's because driving responsibly is the right thing to do. So whether or not uh, laws are in, strictly enforced, whether, whether or not uh, we think a, a cop's going to come and show up and catch us or not, whether or not we think we'll get a fine or not, we obey the law because of conscience, because it's the right thing to do. So let's keep going, and let's read our verses 6 and 7. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So we are also involved in government. This is especially true and obvious for us in a democracy where we get to vote um, for many of our government officials. And also, we can speak to them. Uh, we can, you can call them, you can send them an email. Um, we're not too far from St. Paul that you could drive down there or you could drive to City Hall. Um, and so like, we are able to be involved in the government. We're able to be a part of it with them. And so we're involved. And so that's why we pay taxes. That's why we pay revenue. You know, this is why we, we, we pay our fair share because we're all a part of this together. And we're in this together and we support one another. And it also means we also pay respect and honor. And this will come back later that even when we disagree with others, as Christians, we disagree differently. We don't badmouth, we don't talk down on others. We can disagree with respect and honor. Sometimes that's even harder to pay than the taxes and revenue part. So let's keep going here and let's read uh, just verse eight. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. So we're constantly trying to pay off this debt of love to others. Uh, it's, it's God forgives us. He forgives all of our sins, all the times that we grumble about paying our taxes and revenue. He forgives us for all the times we do not show respect and honor. God forgives us for all of that. He went to the cross for us for all of that. And so now we have this debt of love we're trying to pay off to others. It's like we're constantly trying to love others and show our concern for others. And there's no way we can possibly pay off this debt. So we just keep doing it. We keep loving. We keep serving. We keep being a part of people's lives. So let's end with, uh, let's read then verses 9 and 10 together. 
the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, the fulfillment, our love is the fulfillment of the law. And so even when we disagree, we still do it with respect, honor, and love. This is what it means to be um, a Christian who's a part of a culture. And remember, Paul's writing to Christians in Rome who had it way worse than we did. And yet he says that we submit to the authorities as we submit to God. Which means we follow the laws of the land, even when we don't like them. Now, what do we do when those laws are explicitly against God's word? With that, we go to Acts chapter 5. So keep one finger here on Romans 13 while we turn to our next passage. So while keeping a finger or a bookmark here in Romans 13, let's turn also over to Acts chapter 5. So we're in the Romans, so then the book right before it is the book of Acts. Go out to Acts chapter 5. Uh, at this point in time, it's after Jesus' death and his resurrection. Jesus is now ascended back into heaven. And it's there in those early years, um, that early time after Jesus has gone back into heaven. And the disciples are sharing God's word. Uh, they're speaking the truth about Jesus. Except they've now been arrested and they've just been ordered by the governing authorities to stop talking about Jesus. Uh, they've, been, they've been given a mandate to stop talking about Jesus. And so we can jump down especially to verse 29 here where Peter responds and says, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. So this is what it means is if the law or leaders explicitly go against God's word, then we follow God, not men. So if there's a law that commands us to sin, that tells us to sin, that is explicitly against God's word. Um, we can use kind of a, a clear example of kind of like, say, legalizing abortion. Something that we would say, all right, the ending of a baby's life is bad. Um, even if it came from bad circumstances or horrible tragedy or situations, like intentionally ending a child's life is bad, period. So there's an example of a time when um, we've got the governing authorities that we submit to, but now there's a law that explicitly go against God's word. So we follow God, not men. Again, here's the thing is that most laws do not explicitly go against God's word. It's not like we can say, you know what? That stop sign is against God's word. Um, I, I don't think that stop sign. As a Christian, I shouldn't have to stop for that stop sign. Hmm. So when the officer pulls you over, let me know how that uh, kind of train of thought works. No, a stop sign is not explicitly against God's word. Hence, we stop for stop signs. And we stop for it, not just so we don't get in trouble, but also because it's the right thing to do. As we read in Romans, because of conscience. Um, because we care about the safety of others. So, we've got these, so we can hold these uh, two Bible passages uh, together in context. We submit to the authorities as to God, and we obey God rather than men. So, this means that we follow the laws of the land unless it's explicitly against God's word. And if it's explicitly against God's word, then we follow God, not men. And we openly break the law of the land. But even then, we still do it with respect, honor, and love. So this brings us then to face masks. So is there a Bible verse that says that wearing face masks is explicitly against God's word. Is there a Bible verse about that? I haven't found it. If you know of a Bible verse that, that explicitly says that mandating face masks is against God's word and is against God's plan for our lives, please tell me that Bible verse. I've read the Bible. I didn't find it. Which means, even though, even though we may not want to, even though they're inconvenient, yeah, even though they may be kind of hot 
and sweaty and fog up our glasses, I mean, even though they may be inconvenient and a pain to put on children just to step into a store to go to the bathroom, um, even though they may not be fun, I can't see how they're explicitly against God's word. There's no commandment saying, thou shalt not wear a face mask, which means we obey the law of the land, even when we don't want to. Being a Christian means that we don't get to pick and choose from the law which laws we follow and which we don't. Being a Christian means we follow God's word. And Romans 14 is pretty clear. We follow the laws of the land, unless it's explicitly against God's word. And I can't see anything in scripture that says face masks is against God's word. So let's keep going in. So this is kind of like the, the government part of our Bible study. Now let's transition here and let's start opening up to 1 Corinthians. So let's start out in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, so you can take, you've, you can take your, if you're probably starting to run out of fingers now, so you can take your fingers out of uh, Romans 13 and Acts chapter 5. Actually, uh, so we're going to be spending the rest of our time here, just kind of right here in the book of first corinthians so at this point in time then paul's writing to christians in corinth and again a lot of the face mask thing is not even so much our own health a lot of the face mask thing is is talking about us and others hence if you're at home alone there's no need to wear a face mask because there's no one around you um, if you're outside and you're more than six feet apart and you got the fresh air blowing around and stuff, there's no need to wear a, uh, it, wearing a face mask is not currently mandated because you've got space between one another. If you're if you're with people of your own household, uh, people you live with, you don't need to wear a face mask around them um, because you're all really together. And so, but a lot of the face mask thing. A lot of face mask conversation comes down to what's my relationship to others? Um, how, how do I, you know, how how do I understand my rights as opposed to then how it affects other people? So let's go to First Corinthians chapter six, and I don't have the verses up here on the top of the screen because we're going to read through some of these verses together. So let's start out here in just verse twelve. So at this point in time, uh, the church in Corinth. Uh, they got very excited about their rights. Uh, they liked to stand up for their rights, and they thought that they had the freedom to do whatever they wanted. In fact, in Corinth, they oftentimes claimed how it's my body, and I have the right to do what I want with my body. So God speaks to them through Paul and addresses this. So let's read here in especially verse 12. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So this is a very popular phrase in Corinth at this time, that they would say, everything is permissible. You know, saying, well, I can do whatever I want. You know, and we still say this, this is, phrase is still very much a part of our American culture, where we say, I have the right to do what I want. I have my rights so you can't tell me what to do with my body. This is very much a part of our culture. This is a very much a part of how many of us talk. Um, it's just part of our vocabulary. And so here they're talking about how everything is permissible. And this is the first century Mediterranean way of saying, I have the right to do what I want. And so what, is, what does God say through Paul? He says, well, yeah, everything is permissible for me, but... Not everything is beneficial or helpful. And in fact, it's very easy to become enslaved or mastered by sin. So if, we're, so if our focus is on us and me and my rights, that means our eyes are off of others. We're not, taking, we're not paying attention to others if we're focused on ourselves. And so if we're overly focused on us and our rights, well, then we lose sight of what's beneficial or helpful for others. We're saying, no, I have my rights. I want to do what I want. Okay. But what about others? As Christians, we don't focus on ourselves. Our, our focus is not in and of ourselves. Yes, we do defend ourselves. Yes, we do stand up for our rights. But that's not where it stops. We do it for the sake of others. 
And so everything is permissible. I have the right to do what I want. Okay, fine, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea. It doesn't mean it's beneficial or helpful. And in fact, it's very easy to become mastered or enslaved by sin when we're just focused on ourselves and me and what I want to do. So then Paul builds on this and he gets into talking about how people are saying, well, it's my body and I can do what I want. And in the next verses he goes through and he flushes out and says, yeah, but what you do with your body matters. And so for the sake of time, let's then jump down to verses 19 and 20 at the end of this section. Do you know, not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So, do we own our bodies? Do we have the right do, to do whatever we want with our body? What does God say? God says, no, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Jesus shed his blood in order to buy you, in order to save you, in order to make you his own. So, so no, we don't own our own bodies. We don't have the right to do whatever we want with our bodies. And that's a good thing because Jesus saves us. God's the one who owns our bodies. So the statement to say, well, it's my body and I can do what I want. Well, that's not true for Christians. That's not true for us. Because what do we do? Our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that we've received from God. Therefore, we honor God with our body. We use our body. We use our health. We use our face masks to bring honor to God. Not be, we're not focused on our us and our rights and how, what, kind, what kind of an inconvenience will this be to me. That's not how Scripture talks. Scripture talks about how we honor God with our bodies. God's the one who owns our bodies. And we do not have the right to do whatever we want with our body. So let's keep going here in 1 Corinthians. So now let's flip on over to chapter 8. Uh, and as we're heading on over to chapter 8, then here he's kind of, he's fleshing out kind of what it means for us and our bodies and kind of what it means for, um, for marriage and how our bodies, what we do with our bodies actually matters. And so when we, by the time we get down here into 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and then they're also now they're getting into this saying, well, it's my body. And so if I want to go out with my buddy to this pagan temple and worship the, and, and worship this fake God, well, it's okay because I don't actually believe it in my heart. And Paul's saying, okay, you don't believe it in your heart, but your actions affect others. No person is an island. Nobody lives by themselves. We are all a part of society. We're all part of culture together. Our actions affect others. And as Christians, we take others into consideration. We're not selfish and only focused on ourselves and how things affect us. We're focused on others and we care about others. And so in the midst of this conversation um, where they would have food sacrificed to a fake God and the Christians would get together with pagans and they would eat it and they would say, oh, well, it doesn't mean anything. Paul's saying, yeah, it actually does mean something. You're causing your fellow Christians to stumble because all of a sudden your buddy is seeing you come out of this pagan temple and thinking, wait, I thought he was Christian. What's he doing worshiping Zeus? What's he doing worshiping Aphrodite? What's he doing doing these horrible things with his body? Um, I, thought he was, I thought he was a Christian. So our actions affect others. So in the midst of this conversation, Paul comes especially here to verse 9 where he says, Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So as we use our freedom, and we do have a lot of freedom as Christians, and we do have a lot of choices that we can make. Um, and as, especially as American Christians, we do have a lot of freedoms. And so at the end of the day, we use our freedoms to serve others. We're conscientious of others. That not necessarily that we have to. It's not that we have to be nice. We don't follow the letter of the law just because we have to. We want to. We want to be conscientious of others. We want to take others into consideration. That if we're using our freedoms to cause someone else to stumble, 
then we're sinning. If we're exercising our freedoms and we're making somebody else uncomfortable, uncomfortable to the point where then they don't want to attend Bible study or they don't want to come to worship or they don't want to join us for outdoor fellowship because we're using our freedoms, well, then if we're using our freedoms to make them uncomfortable, then we're sinning. We're sinning against our fellow man. We have, we've been given our freedoms to serve our fellow man, to serve others and to take others into consideration, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's not what I want to do with my time, even if I don't want to wear this hot face mask inside all the time, if it puts others at ease, if it helps, if it helps others to be at peace, then that's what we do. Now we are here to serve others, to be conscientious of others, not just to focus on me and my rights. Our freedoms are not to be used as a stumbling block for the weak. Our freedoms are to be used to serve others, to put them at ease, to help open up doors for sharing the gospel. So let's stay here in 1 Corinthians, and now let's turn on over to chapter 9. So here in chapter 9, uh, we've got uh, verses now uh, 19 through 23. Now, again, there's so much. We're kind of hitting some of the highlights as we're going through. We could read this entire section, um, but for the sake of time, we're trying to kind of catch some of the highlights as we go through. So here in um, 1 Corinthians 9, Paul's especially talking about his rights as an apostle. So Paul was an apostle. I mean, he's one of the most famous Christians who's ever lived. And so Paul, Paul, could, Paul could walk up and just command people to do stuff. And he had the right to do that because he was an apostle. He was a big deal. Um, and yet, Paul talks about how he gets, how he uses his rights. How Paul uses his rights and his freedoms. So we'll pick up here at verse 19 and we'll read all verses 19 through 23 together. It, all, it flows together very well. Paul writes, Though I am free and belong to no man, I will make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though my, I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those who have, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free of God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. Again, he's talking about how, you know, Paul was using his freedoms to serve others and to, and to meet people where they were. Let's keep going here at verse 22. To the weak, I have become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So Paul had the rights. Paul had a lot of rights. He had a lot of authority. He can make a lot of choices for himself. And yet, we're willing to inconvenience ourselves or make sacrifices for the sake of of others. And so Paul, Paul was a free man. He wasn't a slave. Um, he was a free man. He could come and go as he pleased. And yet if it meant opening up doors to share the gospel with slaves, he would make himself a slave. He would do whatever it would take, even if it meant inconveniencing himself in order to open up doors for the gospel. Everything we do is for the sake of the gospel. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Or in some translations, it's share with them in its blessings. And so everything we do is not for us and our rights and what we want to do. We use our freedoms to serve others. Even if it's inconvenient. Even if I don't want to. Even if it's work or it kind of slows things down or it's kind of a pain. We use, God says that we use our freedoms in service to one another. That's what God's got to say. Now, there's many, many other Bible passages we could be able to take a look at, and they all keep saying the same thing over and over again. We use our freedoms to serve others, even when it's inconvenient. Um, we are willing to follow the letter of the law, to follow the law, not because we don't want to get busted or not because we don't want to have a $100 fine, um, but because it's the right thing to do, because that's what God calls us to do. Unless it's explicitly against God's word, then we follow God's word. So let's bring this all together. 
So as Christians, this is what the Bible says over and over and over again. We use our freedom to serve others. And we intentionally limit um, our actions for the sake of others all the time. This is, this is, most of the time we do this without even thinking about it. Um, that, that it's just a part of how we are. We've got traffic laws. And so we could say, well, I have the right to drive as fast as I want wherever I want to go. What about when you're in a school zone? Would you say that I have the right to drive as fast as I want past a school? None of us would say that. Of course not. We limit how fast we drive. We limit ourselves and we use our freedom to keep others safe because we want to protect others. Um, because, you know, now will there be a kid playing out on the street? Hopefully not. But even if they are, even if a ball rolls into the streets or something, we drive slowly past the school for the sake of others. We limit our freedoms to keep others safe. You know, this is true in just covering our cough and our sneeze. You know, how often, um, either as a child, have we, have we heard this? Or have we told a child, cover your sneeze? Like, don't just walk up and hurt you all over everybody. No, gross, cover your sneeze. You know, I mean, don't, don't, you know, a little kid, we say, ah, oh, don't cough in my face. Like, no, cover, cover your cough. You know, of course, like we, this is just a part of everyday life for us that we don't say, I've got the right to sneeze wherever I want. None of us would say that. None of us would intentionally sneeze on anybody, even before COVID. No, we, we limit our freedoms to serve others, that we're not gross. We, we're conscientious of the health of others. You know, this is also an example in, you know, yelling fire in a crowded building is illegal for a good reason. And we wouldn't even dream of doing it. We wouldn't even dream of walking into a, a crowded theater and yelling, fire! And everybody panics and stampedes over each other to try and get out. We, no, we wouldn't say, well, it's my right to say whatever I want. I have the right to yell fire in a crowded building. Of course not. None of us would even dream of saying that. No, because we limit our freedoms for the sake of others. You know, this isn't true even in littering. None of us would say, do you know what? I have the right to throw my garbage on my neighbor's property. Or I have the right to dump this bag of garbage out in the city park next to the playground. None of us would even dream of saying that. Of course not. And we intentionally limit our freedom to serve others all the time. We pick up our trash. We don't litter. We don't dump out a big bag of garbage next to the slide at the neighborhood playground. Of course not. We wouldn't even dream of that because we limit our freedoms as Christians. That's what it means to be a decent human being. We intentionally limit our freedoms for the sake of others. Even though it may be way more convenient to just throw that garbage on the, uh, on the ground, we don't. We walk over and we throw it away in the garbage. We recycle it because it's the right thing to do. Even though it's less convenient, we intentionally limit our freedoms for the sake of others. So, is there a Bible verse on face masks? Is there the one Bible verse that says, thou shalt wear a face mask or thou shalt not wear a face mask? No. The, the term face mask is not in scripture. This is a very new conversation. But as we walk through scripture, as we see this picture that God paints before us, to me, it's pretty clear. Yeah, we do wear face masks. I don't want to. I don't like it. It interrupts my ability to speak. Um, it makes it harder for people to hear me. It's hot. It fogs up my glasses. Even, the, even these really nice ones we've got at church, which are very nice, even them, I still don't like wearing a face mask. But I do it because I care about others. Because that's what God calls me to do, to limit my own freedoms for the sake of others, that by any means possible, I may save some. If wearing a mask puts someone else at ease and opens up doors to share the gospel, I'll wear a mask. Even if in how many years we look back on this time and we do the research and it turns out that the face mask did nothing, even, even worst case scenario, even if it turns out that the face mask did nothing to slow the uh, spread of the virus, if it puts my brother or sister at ease, I'll do it. If it helps keep my brother or sister from stumbling, 
if it opens up doors to share the gospel, how could we not? How could we not, out of love, be able to share with them? And if it turns out that the face masks do do a lot to be able to slow the prevent uh, spread of the virus, well, then we especially care about others and we don't want to get others sick. Just like sneezing or washing our hands after using the bathroom. Um, I mean, some of these things that we just would just say, well, of course we do that because we care about others. Again, if, you, if you've got uh, questions on this, please, as always, let me know. Um, and and if, there, if there is a Bible verse in there, if you think there's some Bible verse where you say that God says that we should explicitly disobey the law of the land and not wear face masks, then please tell me. I haven't found it in Scripture. But if it's there, please tell me, and I will gladly re-record a Bible study and, and, and say it differently. But I can't find it in Scripture where that's explicitly against God's word. It just forces us to be more creative in how we do things. It allows us to inconvenience ourselves for the sake of our neighbor. As always, if you've got uh, questions on this or any other specific Bible study topic, there are something you'd like to be able to see what God has to say about any topic or issue, let me know. We can have our Bible study time beyond whatever issues or topics you like. So as we always love to end our time together in Bible study, let's close with the Lord's Prayer and sing in the doxology. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God's blessings be with you, and I hope you have a good day.